Hey, what's going on guys? It's Michael from the Honest Youth Pastor, the channel that exists to help believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. And today we are going to be doing that by taking a look at a sermon that was preached at a chapel at Osberg uh, University. It is in Minneapolis. It is a U Lutheran. Let's get that out. Lutheran University. And today we are going to be looking at that. It was preached by Pastor Andrea Roski dash Metcalf. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we're going to listen to the, uh, her whole chapel service. Now, as always, if you want to watch the whole thing without my commentary, the link will be in the description below. We are actually going to be starting at the seven minute, nine second mark, because that's where the actual uh, sermon starts. Everything before that is music and announcements. And we'll be looking at this, looking at three things that we look at in all the sermon reviews. One, is scripture read? Two, is scripture taught using context and culture? And three, is Jesus mentioned? Specifically, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that mentioned. Now, to be uh, transparent, I haven't watched this entire talk sermon. I'm not sure how. It can't be that long because the whole video is only 26 minutes and 27 seconds. I, I did see a clip which brought this sermon to my attention over on Twitter, but I haven't been able to watch the whole thing yet. But today, we are going to be doing that together. Now, I do want to make clear. I think there's some sermons that we review that are seen by a lot, lots of people. There's quite a few sermons that we look at that are viewed by hundreds of thousands of people. This particular video only has 312 or 312 views. Now, that being said, I do want to sort of caution us whenever we watch sermons or review sermons that are smaller, that haven't been viewed a lot. Sometimes I think there may be an inclination to go over and like, you know, dislike, mean comment, that sort of stuff. As always, I encourage you not not to do that. Don't be a butthead, be Christ-like. Uh, let's take this for what it is, as with all the sermon reviews, and look at the content of the sermon and say, hey, is this good, bad, ugly, or what can we, what, at the very least, what can we learn from this in regards to the theology that is currently at work in our world, and how can we use biblical discernment to address it? So that is what we're going to be doing today. Let's hop right into it. Don't want to make this too long for you. Uh, once again, if you like what we do here before we get in, there are links in the description that are going to be down there that you can support. You can just listen to the audio version if you <laughs> want to look at my stupid face. You can uh, support via just liking or sharing or commenting on this video, or you can go a step further and maybe become a patron or perhaps buy some of the resources to help you in your own ministry. All that being said, I got you. I got you. I'm done self-promoting. Let's get into this video. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. From the seventh chapter of Mark. From there, Jesus. Okay, real quick. I know that's only been a couple seconds, but I do want us to read along with her. Uh, she doesn't tell us what verse to start. It is Mark chapter seven. We're actually going to start at verse 24. This is going to be uh, the Syrophoenician woman's faith. So if you want to get there, at least that way we can read along with her and we can follow along if she does choose to stay in that passage. It is one of the things just like right away that I'm noting, though, not mentioning the verse. So there's just this assumption that, hey, this is where this is at. But there's not an expectation for you to follow along. Perhaps there is. Everyone in this video seems to have like a bulletin. In that case, it may be printed in the bulletin. So I do want to give them the benefit of the doubt there. But for us that doesn't have that, uh, go ahead, turn to Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Here we go. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him and she came and bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, find, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Okay, real quick before we get into it, the part that I did see, I don't know if I need to include this. 
I would say most of us that are watching this are adults, but just so you know, there is, uh, she does just curse in this video. So I just want to put that out there in case, you know, you need to know that just out there. So, all right, anyway, let's keep going. This has been my favorite Bible story for a very long time. It used to be because it's such a blatant example of the humanity of Jesus. He screws up bigger here than in any story I know. That's still the case, but this is my favorite Bible story today because of the Syrophoenician woman's improv skills. Because the Syrophoenician woman says, yes, and. Yes, and. It's the most subversive phrase in the English language. This woman is Syrophoenician. She is from the city of Tyre, which was considered unclean by observant Jews. From the sounds of it, she is not married, which means that she is divorced or widowed or abandoned. In a culture where a woman's social capital is defined entirely by her connections to men, this woman is an outcast. All right, so there's a few things that we want to note here um, that I've just pulled out from listening to the clip that I listened to. We have to understand that Andrea here is she she calls herself a storyteller along with a few other things. OK, so you're going to notice the inflection that she has in this sermon. You OK, you may not notice the inflection she has. I definitely notice the inflection she has. Um, she, she is purposefully um, doing that in order to really do what she declares herself to be, which is a storyteller, right? She's inflecting certain things, much like you would, like if you were reading a story to kids or something, there are certain things that you are going to draw out or some certain things you are going to emphasize, or you'll, you'll hear it throughout if you haven't already heard it. Um, also, there's a couple of things that I think when we listen to pastors, and I don't know if I've ever noted this before, but it is something that I think is worth noting here. Um, she says uh, something along the lines of the early on there, that this is one of the biggest times Jesus screws up. There are certain things that people will put into their sermons deliberately, like if they are good storytellers, if they are good speakers um, that are that will catch your attention, right? That will make you be like, what? Like they're, they're, they're deliberate words put there. And you need to understand that not only whenever you're listening to sermons like this, but this happens one on one when you're talking to people, people will deliberately put uh, sort of inflammatory words in there to sort of catch you off guard or to sort of, you know, uh, kind of hit you with a right hook to sometimes just to simply make you think about it. Um, but the idea is that they're there to be there. Teenagers do this all the time, right? They'll say something that's like, uh, like just extraordinary to try to find out how you'll react to it. And this is sort of the same thing that she's doing here when she says that, right? She's deliberately trying to uh, make people think or catch them off guard. And you just, you need to understand that as you're listening to not only this sermon, but all, all sermons and even really having interpersonal conversation, there are things that people will say to deliberately try to get you, um, sometimes deliberately get you enraged, uh, or to make it to where you're not thinking clearly, or just to make you sort of try to reconsider a position without out front asking you to reconsider a position. Now, that's a long way to go about it, and that may be reading something into what she's doing, but that seems to be what she's doing. She's also making some, she's also making some assumptions here. We don't know hardly anything about this woman other than her location, her gender, and that she has a child, and that child is demon-possessed. Um, that's all we know. Everything else we're sort of reading on top of this, this idea that she's reading some sort of, um, she, she's not married. She's reading on, she's reading into this idea that there's, you know, this woman is an outcast because of some, um, some situation of, you know, a patriarchal society. Like there, there seems to be some things that she's reading, reading on top of this, right? Now, maybe that's true. Mark doesn't seem to give us this inclination though. Like these are all things we need to know and consider right? Especially when we're talking about context and culture. So there's things that we need to at least note down that she says, such as, oh, she's, you know, a marginalized person. Okay, well, how do we know that? Like, so if we're going to give context and culture, we at least need to write down, okay, well, let's look this up later. And there's nothing that I see in this text that indicates that. 
um, or at least indicates that Mark or Matthew, which this story is also found in, are trying to, 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 to inform us of that. We have that, for example, at the woman of the well. There's this very, there's this huge indication that, hey, this woman is an outcast. Why? Well, it's because the time of day she comes to the well. There's certain things that are um, understood about her by her actions. And here, there's not those same indicators of what's going on. So I think we have to be careful, especially when we're hearing context and culture, that we at least note that down if we're unaware of them and look them up later to see, like, is this a stretch or is this accurate in regards to, to what's happening? So let's get back into it. Jesus does not seek her out. He never intended to talk with this woman, a Gentile. He slipped into an empty house to take a break, to get away from all the people. She follows him. She pursues him. She corners him. Her daughter is sick, possessed, unwell. This woman has heard what this man can do. She is desperate. She has nothing to lose. So she asks him to heal her daughter, and Jesus responds by calling her a bitch. There was the curse word, sorry, I didn't warn you. He said to her, let the children be fed first. He is also, let, let's note that. I guess we should, we'll should. we just use this opportunity to note that. So there is a lot read on to this, no, just not in the wording, but in a, in a few other things. She said earlier about the but and being the most subsur- subversive thing in the English language. I'm sure this pastor knows that this isn't American society that this story is happening in. Um, so to read that on top of it's a little strange. Also, I'll include a link in the description below. We're not going to get into it here because other people have already done the work. There's no reason to rehash it in this video, but I'll provide a couple links in the description below of pastors that have done a very good job of sort of unpacking, uh, what she's actually going to bring up here in a minute, which is how Jesus reacts to and responds to and calls this woman. Um, we, there's been videos after video put out by, I would say people in the progressive Christian camp that have specifically zeroed in on this story, um, to make various points, some of the points, what she's making here. The one thing I would point out without going into a lot of detail to assume that this, that Jesus is calling this woman, a female dog, um, is just incorrect. Uh, at now again, we're not doing a lot of word study, but the word that is being used here for dog is um, I'm not gonna say this wrong. Kieran Narciss. I, I don't know Greek, y'all. I don't. I, I don't know it by heart. I have to use a lot of tools, <laughs> a lot of tools to look this stuff up. The point is, it is when you look up the word as far as definitionally, it's like a house dog. This is something that she understands, by the way. I don't know if we're gonna get into this in this sermon, but this is something that the Syrophoenician woman understands, right? So if we go to verse 28, she says, uh, but she answered him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She understands the, the type of dog Jesus is referring to, if that makes sense, right? There's this understanding that there are, there are like untamed, undomesticated street animals, and that there are animals that, that they have as pets, right? House pets, house dogs, things like that. She apparently, she understands that because she, she references the same type of dog that Jesus calls her in the story when she refers to under the table eating crumbs. Like there's this understanding that she has in responding to Jesus. So I, it's a stretch and it's, and it's volatile language. Like it's purposefully put there as some of the words that were before that she said, to sort of throw you off your game or to get you like sort of aggravated, right? This is deliberate language. She is a storyteller. She's very good, I would assume, just from watching what I've seen of her. She's very good at setting up a story and eliting, I don't know, I can't speak, y'all, eliciting, there you go. She's very good at eliciting emotion from her audience, right? Making connection points. And that's what she's doing here. Um, with this. So just that being said, if you, if you wanted to unpack a little bit more of this, this story that we're going to get in today, uh, in this video, those links will be in the description below for you to do that. He is referring here to the children of Israel, to the Jews. So far, they have been the entire focus of his ministry, but then he continues, 
for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. dogs. There's not enough to go around, he could have said to her. Not enough healing, not enough blessing, not enough God for you or your daughter. That would have been hard to hear. But this. Jesus is tired. He is frustrated. Whatever is going on with him, he calls her people dogs. Some biblical scholars, they try to pull Jesus out of the hole that he has dug for himself here. He's calling them little puppies, they say. This is where these uh, videos below will be helpful to you because there is this idea, um, like, there's, if you haven't seen it yet, I don't know why, why you haven't seen it yet, but there's clearly a, um, a tension between what I would consider Orthodox Christianity following the faith handed down throughout time and progressive Christianity, which is a, a much more recent development and divergence from the faith. Um, and there's tension there. So you hear those people laughing because you're like, yeah, some people try to actually use the, the wording to, to make Jesus sound better, but he's really being racist. Um, so again, those videos below are going to help you with that. But just so you know, like she acknowledges the tension. She's probably been taught like the, the proper way to look at this, um, but she's, she doesn't follow that. She doesn't believe that. But he is not. It's a term of endearment, they say, but it is not. This Syrophoenician woman, this marginalized outcast woman whose daughter is sick, she comes to Jesus for help and he calls her a dog right to her face. She could have slapped him. We would have forgiven her for that, yes? We would have understood. She could have told him off, yelled and screamed in his face. We would have forgiven her for this too. But she does none of these things. Instead, she shifts to improv. Instead, she agrees with him. Instead, she says, yes, and. She answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She takes this horrible thing that Jesus has called her and she uses it for her own ends. She tells him, you have so much healing, you have so much blessing, so much God, all I need are the crumbs. What I want to know that there's, there's a lot of reading into what is being said here. And we need to see that, right? I mean, we see this in a variety of different types of sermons where there's just the assumption made uh, of adding things in that we don't get necessarily from the text, nor do we can we necessarily pick up from the culture or the context of reading it um, within within those those lenses. Before she said that Jesus could have told her there's none of healing or blessing or God for you, and then here she's saying that the Syrophoenician woman is essentially saying there is enough God and healing and blessing for me. I just want the leftover stuff. That's not what is being communicated here. Jesus Jesus makes clear that he is here first for uh, for the people of God, for, for, for Israel, for the Jews. And she seems to understand that up into, up into a point where she can understand that uh, and follow that logical course of thinking. So, okay, well, if you're only here for them, fine. I just, I just need healed at, or my daughter healed as I've she's likely heard, right? We have other stories right after this. We have another story of healing. There's clearly with the crowds that are following Jesus, he's well known for doing this. Um, so she understands that he's able to heal when he confronts her with, I'm not here to heal, to, to not here to heal. That's not what he says. Let's read that real quick. Cause I don't want to do the same thing she's doing. Um, he said to her in verse 27, let the children be fed first, for it is not right for to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This idea that firstly, he's here for the, the people of Israel. She follows that logical idea that he puts out. He says, okay, well, if that's the case, then even the, the house pets, the dogs that are there, get to eat the crumbs from underneath the table. What's happening here, and I know it's, it's, it's subtle and it, it may seem like it's not a huge deal, but... She's not saying what 
Andrea says she's saying. There's a lot read onto this. Not only the fact that she's marginalized or that she's not married or she's an outcast, none of which we have inclination for, other than the fact of where she's from, right? We do have where she's from, uh, deliberately from Mark, again, to indicate, oh, this is, there is a, there is a difference here between Gentile and Jew to set up why Jesus speaks the way he does. Um, but I, I do want us to catch that. And we need to catch that in a lot of sermons, right? Whenever we read a, a passage of scripture, and I've, I've, I've seen this done in non, in, in churches that I would say aren't progressive at all. Um, just that happens often when a pastor maybe gets a little too comfortable. <laughs> he's read the text over and over again. He's preached five different sermons on a particular passage, and maybe he gets a little too comfortable with the passage and reads something into or onto the passage. This isn't just a progressive Christian thing. This happens a lot of times, and we need to watch for that. And if it's pastors, if we're preparing sermons, we need to be careful not to do this. We have, in this particular case, certain parameters that we need to work within. We have this story in Mark and Matthew. That's all we have. We know that she's a Gentile. We know that she's Syrophoenician or in Matthew, a Canaanite, I believe is what he calls her. And so those are the boundaries that we can work in then. That's the information we have. So what can we, from the information given, uh, get from this passage, both that Mark and Matthew are trying to communicate certain things from? Those are the questions that we're looking for. Past that, we're not allowed to read things onto the passage that aren't there. And we need to be very careful about doing that, because when we do that, then we add application or meaning to the passage that isn't there. And we have to be very mindful of that. By now we have heard and we have read all kinds of things about Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. Maybe you have heard that he got his professional start as a comedian. This made sense to me when I first heard it because he has such a comfortable presence in front of the camera. It made even more sense when I learned that it was not stand-up comedy. It was competitive improv. Stand-up comedy is an individual event. Make the people laugh or don't, but it's entirely on you. But improv is a team sport, and the president of Ukraine is inviting his entire country to participate. Yes, and is the basis for improv. You have to agree immediately to the most outlandish scenario that someone has handed you and you have to run with it like you always expected to find yourself there and if you really commit then you can take that outlandish scenario in any direction you choose this is what the Syrophoenician woman did with the insult that Jesus handed to her you want to call me a dog fine you want to talk about feeding the choice cuts to everyone else? Fine. Because if you are the Son of God, then there is enough to go around. There is enough healing and enough blessing and enough God to go around. All I need are the table scraps. I would bet good money that Jesus wasn't expecting that. Like, I don't care if he's the son of God. He didn't see that coming. All right. So a few things, right? Just to, to lend there. Um, there's no indication. And again, this is stuff that's reading onto the text. We have, um, in all circles, especially if you've been in church a long, long time, we have a tendency to read things back into the text based upon what we already know. So if you've been in church your whole life, right, there's, there's, you've, you've probably heard uh, the, the same Bible stories a thousand times. Um, you, you've heard Jesus is the son of God. You've heard, you've heard a lot of uh, preaching on atonement. You've heard a lot of preaching on sin. You've, I mean, this is, these are all assumptions, but in general, you understand what I'm saying. So that when you get to a certain story, such as uh, the recounting of the Syrophoenician woman coming to Jesus, you then read things back into that, maybe even unaware that you're doing so, making assumptions for the woman herself. There is no indication that we have um, in, in, in this passage at all that she assumes that Jesus is the Son of God, that we assume that she thinks he is God in the flesh, 
There's no indication other than she just knows that Jesus can heal people. That's what she knows. And she's so convinced of this that she is willing to come to him, begging him to, to heal her daughter. That's all we have. That's all we know at this point, as far as this particular passage goes. So Jesus goes to the region. He's tired. He wants to, um, well, I'm maybe even assuming that too much there. He said he entered a house. He did not want anyone to know yet. He, so he, yet he could not be hidden, right? So he's going to this region. He doesn't want anybody to know. He wants to hide away. Essentially, he wants to get away from people. And well, who hasn't had that day, right? And what happens is she comes up to him. Uh, it says verse 25, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet, right? So this is all that happens. Jesus is in the region. She finds out that he's in the region. She apparently has heard or at least knows that he is able to heal people. And she comes and falls at his feet, begging him to cast out the demon from her daughter. And then they enter into this conversation. There is no indication, right? So she does call him Lord, right? So there is an indication that he is someone um, important because Lord can mean a variety of different things. It usually within the context, it's going to be known uh, as, um, as someone of importance. We do have this indication um, that she, she may, just by her region, be aware that um, the Jews had this idea that there was going to be a Messiah King coming. So maybe she knew that, but we don't have any indication of that. All of all of this to say, what she talked about with her saying, yeah, but if you are the son of God, you're able to do this. We don't have that. We're reading that back into the text. Okay. And that's an important thing that I think we need to know. We're reading that back in. She does know that Jesus is able to heal. She's convinced of that. She does call him Lord, probably as a title of, of, of like um, importance. That's all we know. And we do know that she assumes that he needs to come and cast the demon out of her daughter, though she doesn't question him when he sends her back and says that it's already done. But there is this idea, much like the other Gentiles that come to him, um, there is this knowledge that he is a healer or a prophet. Past that, we don't really have a lot of idea, even his own disciples, right? Don't fully understand what's going on. So it's a, it's a leap uh, of colossal proportions to assume that these people that are coming up to him think that he is anything more than a healer or a prophet. And we need to be aware of that. Like that not only do we read things back into the text that aren't necessarily stated in the text, but that we need to be aware of that when we're hearing that from preachers as well. And as pastors, right? We need to we need to to be honest about that when we're preaching from these texts to give an accurate uh, indicator of what's happening in the text and not not teach people to read things back in the text, but acknowledge that we are apt to do that, right? Not that necessarily that we're wrong about, you know, who Jesus is. I mean, we see the rest of the gospels, we have the the you know, we, we know the the end of the story. But we need to be careful about reading that back in because that changes things a bit if we're making assumptions that aren't actually there. Right. Let's keep going. This is the beauty of improv. This is what makes it so subversive. Nobody sees it coming. And if you pay attention, you will see people on the margins using it all the time. The stories coming out of Ukraine are chock full of examples. The older Ukrainian woman shoving sunflower seeds into the hands of the Russian soldiers so that when they die, their rotting corpses will fertilize the sunflowers that grow out of their pockets. I don't think the Russian soldiers saw that coming. The Ukrainian soldiers just off the coast, when the Russian warship told them to surrender or be blown to bits, who responded by saying, Russian war... I think there's cursing here too i don't recall i'm just trying to warn you in case you have kids worship go fuck yourself i don't think the russians saw Where that coming but these are the narratives that are buoying a nation right now i have seen examples of this subversive kind of improv on the picket line this week with minneapolis teachers show me any situation 
with a massive power differential, and I will promise you, you can find examples of, subver uh, of subversive improv, examples of people on the margins spinning the narrative, spinning that power differential in order to claim some agency. So I want to make note of what's happening here. So the claim that Andrea is making in this sermon is that there is an enormous power differential between Jesus and this woman. And this woman is speaking, uh, how, is it, how is it put in another video that I watched on this? Um, speaking truth to power, I think is what the, the word usage was. Um, which, which is what Andrea seems to believe because of the examples that she's using to talk, to make her point. What we miss here is what's happening within the text, right? Because that's what we're actually looking at, right? The text, we're not trying to read our own, uh, propaganda or position upon the text. We always need to be careful of that. Not just Andrea, but just everyone to make sure that we're not reading our own ideas back into the text. What we see here again is Jesus going into a place to try to get away from people, to literally hide, uh, to try to get away from people. This woman finds out that he's there. She clearly knows that he can heal. She's got a demon possessed daughter, finds him, begs him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He says, no, I'm here for the people, uh, for my people, essentially not for Gentiles. And she goes, yes, but even, uh, the using the example Jesus uses says, yeah, but even the, the house dogs get to eat the crumbs. And Jesus says after this, and this is the important part. This is where we need to be careful not to like to be aware that we're reading things in, right? So verse 29, and he said to her after this statement, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in, uh, and the demon gone. So for this statement, Jesus says, you may go your way and your daughter is healed. So what statement? But yes, Lord, the statement she makes in 28. Yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table get to eat the children's crumbs. There's a faith that she has that Jesus can do this. So even though he says, I'm, I'm not here like to do, like even though, again, oh, gosh, let's just go back to the text. Forget what I'm saying. Like, let's go back to the text. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not right for the children's bread to be thrown to the dogs. So the idea being that I'm not here for you right now. There, in fact, the idea of how he even words it, let them be fed first. And she has this indication, but yes, even the dogs on the table eat the crumbs. And he says, because of that statement, there's this faith that she has, this determination that she knows that he can do it. She knows that he can and so she keeps pressing into that knowledge that you can do it. All you have to do, like there's other, there's other uh, accounts that we have where people know that, that he can do things and they're asking him to do things. Her, her faith is what enables the healing of her daughter to occur. That she knows that he can. And she keeps pressing about this. So even though he says that I'm not here for you first, she goes, yeah, but you're here. But you're here. Her faith is what does this. Not speaking power, truth to power. Not um, being subversive and twisting Jesus' own words on him. She follows the train of thought that Jesus puts out. And she says, but you can. Right? You're able to. Even, even the dogs eat the crumbs. Saying that even, even though you're not here first for me. I still, I still, my daughter can still be healed. So I want you to see that dynamic because it's very easy to read things on a text where, when it's not there and make it say something it doesn't say. And this text is often used and you'll see that I think even in the examples that uh, the videos in the description sort of unpack better than we're unpacking here, you'll see that that it's really easy to read things on top of it from our own society that aren't there necessarily in the text that we're looking at. So current events are so easily read on by both by, by fundamentalist Christians and progressive Christians and all the Christians in between the societal things that are occurring now through our lenses are so easily read onto the biblical text that aren't necessarily there to make a point we want to make, even though that's not the point the text is making. Here what we see is there is 
a difference as far as uh, region and religion, right? We have a Gentile coming to a Jew. In other places, we see um, a Samaritan coming to a Jew. There's all these interactions that Jesus has with people outside of the people of Israel. And this is another one of those cases in which she knows he can heal. She's heard of his healing. Jesus, over and over again in the Gospels, is it talks about the large crowds that follow him, not because they think he's God, not because they think that he's the Messiah come to overthrow the kingdom, though there are, there are clearly people that follow Jesus because they think he's there to overthrow the Roman government, but a majority of them are simply there to be healed. This is the case with the woman. She knows that Jesus can heal. And she keeps pushing into that, knowing that he can, because she loves her daughter, she wants her daughter healed, and she just keeps pressing in. So I just want to make that distinction, because a lot of the examples that Andrew is using here, I would contend strongly, are being read in from the, our current societal status onto the text, when the text is not saying that. Of their own. It changes the course of history. Jesus said no to the Syrophoenician woman. No, he would not heal her daughter. He called them all dogs. But that woman said yes, and. And by the end of this story, her daughter is made whole again. Jesus screwed up. The Syrophoenician woman used her improv skills to call him on it. Jesus changes course, and this story marks the beginning of his ministry among the Gentiles. Dear friends, I find my redemption in Jesus Christ. But on this day, in this story, the Syrophoenician woman is the one who redeems him, who calls him back to himself, who calls him back to his calling. She says, yes. Okay, I haven't gotten this far, but that's just, we got to stop and address that. I haven't, I didn't get this far. So she calls him back. She redeems him. She calls him back to his calling. Jesus makes pretty clear what his calling is in this passage to first come to the people of God. That's, that's his calling. Um, there is a huge mark within the Gospels. We also see it, obviously, in the New Testament after Pentecost, with Paul especially, of this ministry to the Gentiles. Um, something that, by the way, Jesus' Jesus's disciples really have to work through, um, because that wasn't, that wasn't their headspace. Um, but to, to say that the Syrophoenician woman redeems Jesus and refocuses what he's supposed to be doing is a stretch of stretches. That's, we just don't see that in the text. He makes clear what his mission is. He rewards her for her faith. As we've seen in other places, even though that's not what his primary, what he, he, his primary purpose is at that moment. I think it's just, it's, it's again, like I said before, she's using language purposefully to, to elicit a, a certain set of emotions from people, depending upon where they stand, probably both religiously and politically and theologically. Um, and she's good at it. I'll give her that. Um, but it's disingenuous in, in the fact that that's not really what's happening. Yes, and. And in doing so, she changes everything for herself, for her people, for her God. It's the most subversive phrase in the English language. Yes, and. Amen. Okay, so apparently that's the end. This is, this is a really short sermon review, y'all. Um, so let's, let's address that. One, did she read scripture? Uh, she did. She did read scripture. Did she uh, use context and culture to exegetically work through that scripture? I would, I would say that she believes she did, right? So she did bring out, um, I think, what she believes to be what was happening in that text in regards to power and uh, the, woman, the, the woman in Jesus' power dynamic and the clear conclusion that she has there, but and 
uh, in regards to, you know, subversiveness and changing Jesus' mind. But that's not what's occurring. In fact, I would, I would encourage you to view the videos below in the links below uh, that kind of walk through that a little to, in much more depth, because this is something you're going to come across um, in, in, in your life, right? You're either going to hear sermons preached on it, you're going to interact with people that maybe think this way, or you're going to um, be on the internet and going to see like short TikTok videos or short videos that sort of have this flavor to them. Uh, this the whole flavor of like you thought you knew what this said but you really don't um, and throw in some language like she has right some things that elicit some emotions uh, strong emotions one way or the other um, that aren't necessarily accurate so she thinks that she probably used context and culture I would say she did not um, there's a lot of reading back into this what we what we don't see in the text Lastly, did she mention Jesus in the gospel? Well, she did mention Jesus because she had to mention Jesus. Jesus is in the story. But he, he is seen as um, a very flawed person. Now, there is a reality here that we, we do need to, like, to acknowledge that there are things within Jesus' ministry that we do see Jesus being truly human. Um, but then there are things that she discounts as far as Jesus screwed up. He didn't know what he was doing. He essentially sinned here. Uh, though I, I don't think she flat out said that. But there are things that he had to be corrected on. Um, she did say that. And so there's this idea of presenting Jesus in a way that, yes, is, is to see as him as human, which I think is really downplayed often within, uh, within evangelicalism specifically today, um, which we, we really need to sort of teach a little bit more on as it is part of you know christian belief and the, the essentials of the creeds um that jesus is truly god and truly man but she takes it to a point in which um he's just like you and me i mean there is no difference between him he can screw up he can be corrected he can have blunders um he can sin um so there are things that we need to be careful of this is not a gospel presentation this is not uh, a Jesus that can save you from your sins. This is not a Jesus that can go to a cross and die for you. She does say that she finds her redemption in Jesus. She did say that. But one of the things we have to be like mindful of are definitions. Because oftentimes we will hear someone use a word and assume that their definition of that word is the same definition we're using. And in the past, we could be pretty safe in doing that but anymore you don't know right if somebody says they're a woman you have no clue if their definition of a woman is the same as yours if somebody uses the word redemption you don't know what they mean by that and these are the questions that we just need to be aware of when we're hearing sermons right so one did she read the text yes she did two did she use context and culture to exegete that text to teach it i would say no and did she talk about jesus and the gospel a very big no there now obviously this was short and hopefully this will give you more time uh, to watch the videos below because those are going to hopefully unpack this in a more full way really looking at um, the language the culture and the context in ways that she did not um, to demonstrate um, really how she's wrong in, in saying what she's saying here we need to be aware of that when we listen to sermons no matter where they're from and ask those three questions so guys hopefully this very short sermon review is helpful to you if you liked it uh, make sure you click that like button if you disliked it go for it nobody will but see it but me and i can go cry in the corner by myself and if you want to support further make sure you subscribe to this page or check out the links below guys thank you for watching follow and doing all the cool things that you do i'll talk to you next week